during this one day conference, one of third of this audience could die of opioid. I'm trying to scare you. I'm serious. 130 people die every day from opioids. Based on our government data, the number of deaths caused by opioids, whether synthetic or prescription, has been skyrocketing, as you can see from these graphs. So the green graph goes really sharply up, and that's any opioids, but also the prescription drugs, opioids being as, given as pain medicines, are dramatically rising as well and killing people. About 50,000 of them died in 2017. And it turns out, since 99, the number of people dying from opioids increased six times. Why is that? Well, one of the driving reasons is actually chronic pain. And the reason chronic pain is part of the problem is we still give opioids as chronic pain treatment. And as you might learn today, sometimes that's valid and sometimes maybe not necessary. One third of patients given opioid by a doctor to treat their chronic pain eventually misuse them one-tenth develop opioid abuse disorder. Now, these are good people, like every one of us here. They're given opioids as a pain treatment. So we need a better way. We need a solution to the opioid crisis and dramatically change the way we treat and understand chronic pain. So I'm inviting you today to, when you are in pain, and I hope you never are, innovate. My name is Dr. J, as you have heard, and I do nanotechnology for pain as one of the options, one of the solutions. So what is nanotechnology or nanotechnology-driven medicine? Nanomedicines or nanoparticles are about 100,000 fold smaller than a tip of a pencil. So they're very, very small. The good news about nanoparticles, you can design them to be incredibly multifunctional. So if you think about pain and chronic pain as a design problem, then I'm trying to offer to you one of the solutions, nanotechnology and its multifunctionality. So if you think of pain medicine as a nanomedicine, there are three things that nanomedicine could do. Treat pain, target pain where it comes from, and diagnose pain. So the insight to reach into nanotechnology toolbox to treat chronic pain, to understand chronic pain, and to come up with better pain medicine actually came from lived experience. So we know for millennial humans were innovating based on their lived experience. We heard a lot of innovation today. What I'm trying to do today is invite you to join me. So stand up, everybody, right now. And I'm asking you to clap as loud as you can. Really, really loud. Now we have to stop. Stop. Sit down. Take your palms and face it, make them face each other. So you might feel all kinds of things. You might feel tingles. If you really like my talk, you, you clap so hard that your actual hands hurt. That's something that I actually want you to experience. This is how you start to become an innovator in pain medicine. So if you go to a doctor for your pain, <laughs> or if I ask you what it feels like, this is what you're going to be given, a pain scale. So now you tell me, where is your pain? Is it, ah, it's tolerable, it's fine, you know, she's not so good of a speaker, so I didn't have to clap so hard. Or I really was excited, now my hands hurt, so you are on the red face, red face line. If your pain is unfortunately on the red side, that's pretty much all the tools I have to ask you about your pain levels right now. I don't have anything better. I have to ask you and you're gonna tell me. But that's a very important clue for innovation, our experience of pain. So if I came down and tell you, I'm a pharmacist, I'm gonna give you a medicine. Let's say I give you an aspirin. What will that medicine do? Will it go just to your hands that actually hurt? Or will it go everywhere? It turns out today's pain medicines, all of them, are designed fairly poorly, in my opinion, because they don't follow where the pain comes from. 
and also they don't follow the experience of a person with pain. That means that the pain medicine that we have today doesn't really know how you really feel and also doesn't follow fully the biology. It turns out the way we treat pain is as if we are trying to put out fire. So if you think of inflammation that's happening in your hands and immune cells talking to nervous system causing that pain experience, if we want to quiet that down, we want to quiet that particular area. It turns out today's pain medicine looks something like this. You have one house on fire, but you're trying to flood the entire city to put out fire in one house. That's not very efficient design. And we really don't have the good design for either acute or chronic pain. We're a little bit better at treating acute pain, but for chronic pain, that's also much more personal, we have very difficult time to treat it and especially to bring it back all the way to healing to the point where people don't have it. So there are two types of pain. One is acute, which you just probably felt, meaning there is an injury, you feel some pain, and then the injury heals and you don't feel it anymore. You might be given pain medicine for that, and you might feel better in a, a week maybe. But for chronic pain, it's different. That pain persists long after the disease have, might have healed, long after the injury is gone, long after infection is gone. And sometimes chronic pain seems to happen on its own. Something happens in our brain that drives the chronic pain and it just stays. Chronic pain is actually a huge burden on the society worldwide. One in every 10 people worldwide, based on the World Health Organization, suffers chronic pain that's diagnosed as chronic pain. And depending on which agency you ask in the United States, about 50 million of people are diagnosed with chronic pain. That's an enormous amount of people. But think about this. We are all given more or less the same treatment that's fairly inefficient. And all of us are unique humans. How do I know a lot about chronic pain? Well, I'm one of those 50 million people. I lived with chronic pain. And actually, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Not these nice ones, though. So I was hanging out with my son, who's actually in this audience, when he was about 15 months old, in his playpen. And after playing with blocks, I just couldn't get up. I felt as someone was clapping all over my body and wouldn't stop. And it hurt a lot and took me aback to figure out what's going on. So what I have started to investigate at the time is what was happening in my own body. Well, it turns out you have nervous system involved and immune system. These two talk to each other and they drive chronic pain as an experience. So when you were clapping your hands, there were receptors in your hands. They're called nociceptors. These receptors tell your nervous system that something's changing, something's unpleasant, something's driving a painful experience but they're not the only ones. There is the immune cells that also rush to help. What they're supposed to do, they're supposed to come to the area of injury, produce chemokines, cytokines, certain types of cells come, and they're supposedly trying to heal the injury. Well, in patients that suffer chronic pain, that process goes rogue. What happens is those immune cells now start doing something they're not supposed to, producing too much of those chemicals. And if they do, you experience chronic pain long after the injury is supposed to heal. So I reached into my own body as the laboratory. The first insights came from my own lived experience with chronic pain. What did I know about it? I knew it changed. It was different in the morning versus lunchtime. If I slept well, it felt a little bit easier. So it was fluctuating throughout the day. Also, it changed where it hit me throughout the day, different parts of my body. And I started to understand that the process that was driving that pain was called inflammation, and that fluctuated throughout my experience. I wanted a pain medicine that will work with my body, not against it. So I wanted a pain medicine that looks something like this. I wanted to change. I wanted to use it only infrequently. I wanted to be very safe. I didn't want to worry about side effects much less addiction. I, didn't, I wanted it to be very easy to use. I wanted it to be inexpensive. 
adaptable to my body, to be exactly designed for Dr. J's pain and nobody else's, and I wanted to be targeted. I wanted the medicine only to go where I was hurting and nowhere else. And finally, I wanted to be fully, fully personalized. There was no such pain medicine eight years ago when I started my research. So at the time, I decided I'll join with a few people and try to make one. So this is the idealized scheme of how a pain nanomedicine is designed. If a body has different levels of inflammation, it will have different pain. A smart nanoparticle will be able to chase after those very immune cells that drive that inflammatory process that drives the pain. Now, our lab is also capable of introducing diagnostic agents into these nanoparticles. So ideally, a person will be given this pain nanomedicine, and then they will be subjected to some kind of imaging modality, let's say magnetic resonance. And the physician will be able to tell not only whether the medicine got where it's supposed to go, but how well it's working. So this is a strategy, a conceptual strategy of how we can have fully personalized and tunable pain nanomedicine to the experience of a very person that's in pain and that follows that person's experience throughout a day, two days, two weeks, couple months. Importantly, this strategy is also to make pain medicines more effective. So in our current paradigm that we're developing in our lab, the medicines that are packaged into this are something of like an aspirin. But with this strategy, the patient will be given 3,000 times less of a medicine that would, they would normally get if they took a pill. And also, this strategy has potential to make the treatment incredibly infrequent. Maybe we'll be able to treat certain times, types of pain once a week, once a month. And ultimately, if we are truly successful, the immune system will be changed in such a way that supports healing of the damage to tissues that drives pain, but, and then the pain medicine won't be needed. So this is designed that you won't need it too long. Now, pain nanomedicine sounds very complex. So one expectation is it should be expensive. One of the big efforts in our lab is to use a methodology that has been used in pharmaceutical industry for about 20 years now, called quality by design. What we are doing is using mathematics to predict certain attributes of our pain nanomedicine to make it truly perfect. So from the day one of the design, we're thinking of this as a future medicine for a person, for one unique person. So we're trying to use this methodology to cut the cost and make it as high quality as we can. We're looking at nanomedicines as actual medicines. Now I told you this new design that came about. What I didn't tell you is how this all happened, except me getting fairly sick and trying to understand how pain is actually living in the body. What is driving it? So in 2011, I actually invited a few faculty from our Duquesne University campus for lunch. My division head at the time paid for that lunch. It was about $150, I still remember. Eight faculty responded to that invite, including John, uh, John Pollock, the professor who is actually co-director of the Chronic Pain Consortium, and several others. And we all started to brainstorm how to approach this complex problem of chronic pain with, from as many angles as we can. My understanding of chronic pain was very holistic. I wanted us to look at designing pain medicine in a holistic way. Look at the whole person and their experience as a source of data, plus understand biology as much as we can, plus introduce technologies like medicinal chemistry, nanotechnology, neuroscience, psychology. So our chronic pain consortium today has 27 faculty across campus. We have schools represented from law school to pharmacy school to nursing to occupational therapy. We have invited everyone. For eight years, we actually have worked together and talking about ripple effect based on the way we were structured as, an, as a joint organization, other consortia were formed. But most importantly, we are inviting everyone to join into the chronic pain research with us and bring their skills and assets. Only through integrated convergence of innovation can happen. 
So I'm inviting you to talk to your parents, grandparents, and anyone else that you know that lives with chronic pain and ask them what pain medicine they want, because that's where the design starts. Thank you.